Corey. <laughs> Val uh, supposedly sent to my email a picture so I could show it to you of the pierogies that she sewed, and they were so good, really, the pirates should probably sue her. Um, <laughs> but I never got it, so. Um, all right. So uh, two things I wanted to say. Jeff, thank you for keeping Ryan writing. Good job. <laughs> and Alex, you might be walking me to my car because you're scary. <laughs> you scared the shit out of me. <laughs> <laughs> no joke. <laughs> so I'm just going to read uh, two poems. One I'm reading because we're in such an adamantly English department. Um, and then we'll all be sort of familiar with our own narratives about how we, we got to this state. How did we get here, right? Um, this is called What It Took. Books mattered little to me growing up, and mom, you were a wreck. Banishing the TV from my psyche, breaking down late nights on the phone. From my bookless cell in seminary housing, I'd hear you. I just don't know what to do with her, you'd sigh while I'd grimace and fold at the reminder of my herdom. She comes home from school and does nothing. Nothing. But this wasn't true, Mom. And how would you know what I did when I got home from school? My latch key, a sharp jingle against my hip. It wasn't true that I did nothing. I was busy. Busy dialing the first six digits of Megan Carney's house to tell the dial tone I loved her. Phone numbers used to be seven digits. Kids. <laughs> I was busy, Mom, shutting myself behind flimsy doors to write the stories that still don't exist for girls like your kid. Later, at 16, a sullen truce slouched between us. You left me alone. I no longer heard your laments in the night. You resigned yourself to my calling, falling in love with Rachel Barton, whose backyard was a snow-blown Shenley golf course, our very own Wuthering Heights. Her parents, the professors, politely unfazed on Gentleman Jack, invited me in for Shabbos and secularism, a tipsy line dance on polished oak floors, sex with their daughter on flannel duvets. It was on such a night I decided I recall the gingery love seat, limbs lost in plush, Rachel's baby blue moons, historic and vague in the ochre dusk of the desk lamp, Jack Daniels courting my soul. I decided to become a professor. <laughs> a professor of what? asked my girlfriend, deflatingly pragmatic and swift. I thought of my math scores abysmal. Considered science's irreversible wrongs when my mind's moonlit eye spied my mother, sighing as she shuffled along each book-clad wall of our row house. What to read? What to read tonight? A professor of English literature, I announced, more certain of my home in this world than I had ever been or would ever be again. Well, said Rachel, neutral as mathematics, You'd better start reading. <laughs> that night I started life over, began at the beginning with the secret garden, narrated out loud by the first girl to destroy me. Next was Mistress Masham's repose, then Stuart Little, Louise Fitzhugh, Anais Nin. At 20, I would ravish John Gardner in a reckless week, Fate latched on and landed me smack in the middle of the overcrowded nowhere that is graduate school. All of us careening towards becoming professors of English literature. My mother has her heart for dinner every night. What it took was whiskey's tawny whisper along the bourbon floorboards of somebody else's parents, while nostalgia for the future cast its dizzying, dizzying fog over the frank, violet stare of love. That's what I'm dressed as for Halloween as an English professor. <laughs> <laughs> we got the blazer and the death stare, I always say, if you're good. Um, <laughs> right, Ryan? <laughs> Exists. 
exists in, on Earth that I know of. Actually, I was looking in my, my full-length book, desperately trying to find anything with the word Halloween in it. And uh, there's a poem in there that like, I didn't even know was in there. I mean, that's, that's embarrassing. <laughs> and a little bit of a luxury problem, I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> Uh, or this is a poem uh, called The Outsiders. Um, some of you may have also been obsessed uh, or never heard of it. <laughs> um, but it was uh, turned in the early 80s into a movie with some pu pretty beautiful men in it at the time. <laughs> Rob Lowe, Patrick Swayze, um, C. Thomas Howell, who we've never heard from again, really. So, uh, <laughs> The Outsiders. I am in fourth grade, and it is my brownie true Halloween party. I have painstakingly combed Johnson's baby oil, a cup of it, into the obstinate root system of my frizzy blonde hair. This will not be one of the worst mistakes in human history until bedtime. <laughs> I have a photo from this night. In it, I am in the living room of our Elgin Street apartment with my Exxon Valdez spill of a mane and a Minnie Mouse muscle shirt. Already at nine, I am a little in love, if not exactly aware of the irony here. Two-bit, played by Emilio Estevez, wears a Mickey Mouse T.C. We are the same person, which is what I've been my whole life trying to tell you. At the Brownie Halloween party on, at Fulton School, I am not the only greaser. Christy D'Angelo has swiped my thunder. In a few years, Christy and I will play house, which involves me straddling her big belly and pretending to beat the shit out of her while her little brother Anthony watches. In the background <laughs> chirps the Brady Bunch. You really can't make this shit up. <laughs> anyway, Christy, fat, bullied, tragic. And yet here among the strawberry shortcakes and smurfs, she swaggers, her swarthy Italian duck's tail rivaling Ralph Macchio's, her oversized leather and Levi's bear a tough butch broad I do not want to fuck with. <laughs> she summons one dense finger, come here. It is not cool at all that my identity has been co-opted by fat Christy D'Angelo, her toffees swapped tonight for the same black converse under my own rolled cuffs. For this coincidence, I don't feel one bit less alone in the world. I like being alone in the world. I come here. But, she challenges, do you have one of these? From her denim back pocket, she pulls what I know from my S.C. E. Hinton immersion is an honest-to-God switchblade. Black plastic casing, indestructible, a slender, intimate gun. She opens it, slow and sudden, and now it's reality as as long as a child's arm, the blade shiny enough to do your hair in. I shake my head, staring. I don't have one of those. <laughs> I have the dull, stubborn pocket knife I stole from my grandma's junk drawer last week under the shrill eye of her parakeet, Bobo. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. And which I will put back while grandma's in the bath because the guilt is keeping me up nights. No, I say, still shaking my head. I sure don't. No knife, no balls, no penis. You better believe this is about the body. I have a Minnie Mouse t-shirt, not even Mickey. Its collar now dark and sopping with baby oil underneath the already unbearable chest. I have a copy of The Outsiders, pruned and coverless from when it fell in the bathtub. I have identical laurel editions of Rumblefish, That Was Then, This Is Now, and Tex, which I would rather read than breathe or eat, or even sing along to the police, synchronicity, my first favorite thing to do. I have even less than Christy, who doesn't have a penis either, but is at least armed. Rivals forever now, we do as men do, slouch to opposite corners of the brownie Halloween party, two butch baby dykes trying it on. Thank you very much.